The following lecture is aimed for dental students, dental interns, junior dental trainees, residents of oral surgery and oral and maxillofacial surgery. We hope that you all benefit from it. In memory of my late parents, may almighty merciful God rest their souls in heaven and peace. Please allow me to give a brief bio about the speaker. My name is Mohammed El Shulkami. I'm a professor of oral and maxillofacial surgery at the Faculty of Dentistry, Suez Canal University in Ismailia, Egypt. This lovely city, which lies around 120 kilometers to the eastern of the capital Cairo in Egypt, it was named after the late uh, great ruler of Egypt, Khedive Ismail, the one who did the opening ceremonies of the Suez Canal in 1869. I'm also the professor and the supervisor of the oral maxillofacial surgery department at Faculty of Dentistry, Sinai University, Kantara campus in Ismailia. I also worked as a part-time associate professor at MIU University and MSA University for several years. I'm a visiting professor at the Faculty of Dentistry, Beirut Arab University in the oral and maxillofacial surgery department in Beirut, Lebanon. I'm also the Managing Director of the Egyptian Dental Center, a multi-speciality discipline dental and maxillofacial center based in Cairo, Egypt. Our topic for today is management of mandibular fractures, and I can assure you this is one of the most interesting topics in maxillofacial surgery. We are going to discuss etiology, classification, clinical examination, radiological examination, and management. Actually, we have a variety of causes for facial fractures, on the top of which is the road traffic accidents or car accidents, followed by assaults and interpersonal violence, falling from height, sports injuries, industrial, occupational and mishaps, and last but not the least, pathological fractures. You always have to bear in mind that the facial fractures is related to the Car accidents are far more frequent in persons who do not wear restraints such as seat belts or helmets while driving their cars or bikes. Different classifications, different perspectives. The mandibular fractures are classified according to anatomic location and according to the condition of the bony fragments around the fracture site and whether it is communication with the external environment or not. And last but not the least, according to the angulation of the fracture line. According to the anatomic location of the fracture, we have the midline symphysis fracture, and on either side of it, till the canines, we have the parasymphysial area or the parasymphysial fracture. Posterior to that, we have the body fracture, and far more at the angle, we have the angle fracture. Upwards, we have the ramus fracture and anteriorly coronoid process fracture, and the condyle is divided into a subcondylar fracture and the higher condylar or the intracapsular fracture. Higher incidence of occurrence is in the condylar area, followed by the angle fracture, and then followed by the rest. And you might ask yourself, why is the condylar process and the angle has the highest incidence? Actually, they do happen directly and indirectly. When a blow is directed towards an ipsilateral side, it results in a fracture on the contralateral condylar or the contralateral angle. So they do occur in a direct fashion and indirect fashion. That's why they bear or they have the higher incidence of occurrence. From the point of view, this classification is one of the most important classifications. It is based on the condition of the bony fragments at the fracture site and possible communication with the external environment. We have five categories, green stick fracture, simple, compound, complex, and comminuted fractures. The green stick fractures actually uh, are incomplete fractures. It occurs in flexible bone, usually in the children and in young adolescents. Uh, they exhibit minimal mobility when palpated, and the fracture is incomplete and the periosteum is intact in most instances. This is an occlusal view showing an, a green stick fracture of the mandible. So as you see on the left hand side picture, one of the cortex of the bone is broken and the other one is just bent and we have the periosteum intact. So it is highly characteristic in children. The simple fracture is by definition, it's a complete transaction in the bone. There's complete transaction 
not like the green stick case but there is minimal fragmentation at the fracture site and always remember there is no communication with the external environment whether it is an intraoral environment or the extraoral environment on the, on the other hand the compound fracture is named when you get when we get the fracture line communicated with the external environment and in the maxillofacial area we have a variety of places to get communicated with the fracture line intraorally we might have some mucosal tears perforation through the gingival sulcus and periodontal membrane when you have teeth coming in the fracture line communication with the sinus lining and lacerations of the overlying skin some operators might use this laceration to get access to the fracture and do an open reduction then they close the skin in layers but by definition and by default, any fracture within a tooth-bearing segment is considered as an open and a compound fracture through the sulcus and the periodontal ligament of the teeth. And it is obvious that a grossly displaced fracture like that one will of course have a mucosal or a skin laceration and will be a compound fracture. The complex fracture is the same as the compound fracture, but we have extra uh, um, vital structure damage like a neurovascular bundle or a salivary gland duct or whatsoever and coming to the comminuted fracture when we have the fractured bone coming in multiple segments or multiple fragments it usually happens with gunshots penetrating objects and other high impact injury some authors prefer not to do an open reduction for such a uh, fragmented bone and they do a closed reduction conservative reduction because they, they don't like to strip the, 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 the tiny bone fragments of their periosteal blood supply. Last but not the least, the favorable and unfavorable classification. It depends upon the angulation and the direction of the fracture line and the force of the muscle pull proximal and distal to the fracture. In the favorable fracture, the direction of the fracture line and the action of the muscle proximal and distal to this fracture tends to reduce the fracture like we see in this figure. On the other hand, the unfavorable fracture, where the direction of the fracture line and the muscle pull proximal or distal to this fracture line tends to displace the fracture like the figure we see on the right hand side. Here we can see you can classify a favorable or unfavorable in a horizontal fashion or a, or a vertical fashion or a horizontal plane and vertical plane the figure a and figure b uh, in figure a you find it a favorable fracture there is no displacement but in figure b it is horizontally unfavorable it displaces the fracture upwards in figure c the fracture is a vertically favorable one when the medial pterygoid acts upon it on like on the right hand side figure you see that it tends to reduce the, the both ends together but in the figure D, you find that the direction of the fracture line tends to be unfavorable. So when the uh, medial pterygoid or lateral pterygoid acts on this, the, the distal, uh, the proximal segment, it tends to uh, displace it medially. And accordingly, we can sum up the factors that lead to displacement of the mandibular fractures, on top of which comes the direction of the fracture line, as we discussed. The second comes the muscle pull. The third is the tooth in the fracture line which is a very important one, and last but not the least, the direction and magnitude of the blow itself. We have discussed the direction of the fracture line and the muscle pull. Let's have a look on the top uh, panoramic views, the left side. We have this wisdom tooth, which might be seem to anyone, it, it has no use. It can be pulled out while dealing with the fracture, but actually this one can let the operator do a conservative or a closed reduction for this fracture because it comes in occlusion with the upper jaw and it prevents displacement of the proximal segment and this angle non-favorable fracture on the right upper view we have this premolar also keeping this proximal fragment of this unfavorable body fracture from being displaced upwards by the action of the masseter muscle so if we are able to retain this teeth and they are indicated to be kept, they are going to be of great use to keep the good occlusion and prevent displacement of the, of the fracture line, of the fracture. On the below 
uh, panoramic views, we, is, we are going to see here we have both unfavorable fractures, uh, body fractures on the right and the left. And thanks to the dentition present, the presence of this dentition keeps in occlusion with the upper jaw and it prevents further displacement of the proximal segment of the fracture. And so we have teeth in the fracture line. Sometimes we, can, we, ha we have to decide if we can remove them or not. Sometimes they are, they are like the, a gold or like a jewel, a precious jewel that prevents displacement of the fracture. But sometimes we are obliged to remove. We have absolute indications to remove teeth in the fracture line, like if the tooth is longitudinally fractured, dislocated or subluxated, presence of uh, periapical infection, if there is infection of the fracture line due to presence of this tooth, or if the tooth is coming with acute pericornites. However, we have also relative indications to remove it if there is advanced caries or periodontal disease beyond restoration. If this tooth is doubtful and would be added to an existing partial denture, or if the tooth is untreated, fracture uh, presenting for more than three days after injury and having signs of infection. We might, in the relative indications, weigh the benefits against the risk if we keep this tooth. But if we decide to keep the tooth, we should do good intraoral periapical radiograph to evaluate the condition, give systemic antibiotics uh, preoperatively and postoperatively, splint the tooth if the tooth is loose or mobile, and if the pulp is exposed, we should institute endodontic therapy at once. If uh, the fracture line becomes infected postoperatively, we should do immediate extraction of the tooth if we can deal with the infection otherwise. And the tooth should be followed for uh, one year, uh, do a follow-up uh, one year after the fracture. And if we, there is loss of vitality, we can do endodontic therapy as well. We have some additional indications for removal of teeth in the fracture line, like when the teeth itself, it might interfere with the reduction of the bony fragments. Here we have the opposite. It's not like a gold the jewel or, or, or like a, a pressed jewel. Uh, it will not help us in, the, uh, in, in uh, preventing the displacement of the fracture, but of, on the other hand, it is interfering with the reduction of the bony fragments. So in, in this instance, we have to remove the tooth and resort to open reduction. But Sometimes we, are, we have contraindications to remove this tooth. If this tooth had a good attachment and good adequate bony support, and as we said before, it is maintaining the fixation of the fracture bony segment in a conservative fashion. It prevents displacement of the proximal segment. And here comes the clinical examination under the headings inspection, palpation, and auscultation. What are we... Uh, supposed to find in, in cases of mandibular trauma or mandibular fracture. Uh, what we called Coleman's sign, lingual hematoma with buccal and we have lingual sulci ecchymosis and hematoma. We have step defect deformity in the, in the inferior border, malocclusion of course, uh, teeth mobility or segments mobility. We'll have pain and limitation of the mouth opening. And on the right hand figure, we are summing up all the signs and symptoms pain, malocclusion, edema, open mouth limitation, protrusion limitation, lateral excursion limitation, occlusal or, uh, alteration, crepitation, which, which might be felt with, with a sensitive tactile sense uh, operator, or uh, you can use auscultation to, to, to feel the crepitus of, 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 of the bony segments or in the, in the condyla fracture. My, we might have also parathesia, uh, facial asymmetry, uh, hematoma, bruises, and maybe emphysema also. The clinical examination should be done in a systematic way. You put your finger in the external auditory meatus and let the patient open and close or do the lateral excursions to feel the condylar movement. Is it normal or abnormal? And to compare the right side with the left side. Then you come downwards from the condyles and palpation of the posterior ramus border and then the angle and then the inferior border until coming to the symphysial area. You, f you, are, you are looking for uh, swelling, a step or a tenderness upon pressure. The gold standard by manual palpation for the suspected segments is very valuable in detecting any mobility. You, 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 you should suspect a fracture and then order an x-ray to confirm it. So, to sum this up, we have also what we call a positive tongue blade test. A positive tongue blade test, when the tongue blade is put between the upper and the lower teeth and let the patient bite on it and uh, 
when you try to, to twist this tongue blade, the patient cannot be able to, to break it. This is called the positive uh, tongue blade test. But if the patient can break this blade test and, and, and the mandible is intact and not broken, this is called the negative tongue blade test. And on the uh, down link here, you might follow this link and you will see a valuable video showing this exam. We have a very delicate situation in cases of bilateral parasympathial fractures. On the left hand figure, you might see a floating piece of bone and when the genial muscles or the muscles attached to the genial tubercles pull this backwards it might lead to the what we see on the right hand figure that the tongue will fall backwards closing the upper airway actually this is not the case typically because most conscious patients are able to retain their airway in one way or, or another but if the patient lies on his back and 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 at as a result of the of the trauma, maybe there is some brain concussion. Maybe he, he might fall in a nap or lose his consciousness for, 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 for a few seconds. Losing consciousness or lying on the back might lead to falling back of the tongue. And maybe the patient, even if he's a little conscious, might not be able to keep or retain his airway. So the patient should be escorted and should be closely monitored, not to be left lying on his back. Or if the consciousness deteriorate, we should activate the BLS and pull the tongue uh, upwards so or, and, 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 and forwards to prevent falling of the tongue and closing the upper airway. What about the radiographic examination? What should we order when we suspect mandibular fractures? On the right hand side we see what we call the lateral oblique view. It is very good to show the posterior body fractures and angle fractures. And in the middle, we can see the posterior anterior view, which is typically good for body and angle fractures. And on the left hand side, we can see the reverse Towns view, which is typical for condylar fractures. And it shows the mediolateral orientation of the condyles. Of course, the gold standard panoramic view is very good to show you any fracture in the, in the mandible, whether it is parasympathial body angle and it shows also the anterolateral aspect or anterolateral orientation of the mandibular condyle but sometimes in, in certain uh, condylar fractures or in certain conditions in intracapsular fractures it might not be able to show it maybe the CT, the CT would be valuable for that here the CT we have on the lower left uh, coronal CT showing clearly a condylar fracture and in the middle we have the uh, uh, axial CT and also we can have sagittal reformation from the CT and of course the 3D uh, reconstruction of a CT images is very uh, helpful and very valuable in management of maxillofacial trauma. Let's come to treatment of facial fractures or mandibular fractures. First of all, we should think, think of the patient's satisfaction and convenience. The treatment and healing phase, it's going to bear some discomfort to the patient, whether it is a, a closed reduction operation or an open reduction operation, the patient's nutritional status and comfort in general will be distressed during the healing phase and, and, and the treatment period. So we should put among our goals to achieve the patient convenience and, and the patient satisfaction and we should plan our treatment plan to give the patient the least amount of discomfort and inconvenience. We have general goals of course when treating the mandibular fracture. We should promote rapid bone healing. We should get an acceptable facial and dental aesthetic result and the return of the normal ocular masticatory nasal restoration of the speech and restoration of the function in general. And this cannot be achieved unless we have a good occlusion. I'm, I'm putting the occlusion twice because the whole mark of the success of uh, maxillofacial trauma management is the occlusion, keeping a good occlusion. If you have teeth in occlusion, then anything can be restored otherwise. Management protocol, we have reduction and then followed by fixation and immobilization. Those are the golden standards, are the golden rules, or the, or the golden three protocol 
components, reduction, then fixation, then immobilization. Reduction means putting the fracture segments together in the anatomical pre-existing or the pre-traumatic position. And then fixation, which keeps fixing both segments together in order not to get displaced afterwards. And immobilization means that we, we, we should fix the mandible and, and, and do prevent it from doing its normal function, masticatory function, during the, he the healing phase. So, as we said, reduction and fixation and immobilization. In addition, the preoperative occlusion, as we said, should be restored. This is the whole mark, and this is the, the clue that we have a good and successful treatment. Of course, any infection in the fracture line should be eradicated and prevented and treated vigorously. Let's shift to reduction. We have two types of reduction. Open reduction, when we get a direct access to the fractured bony segments and do fixation directly. And closed reduction, when we utilize the dentition or the teeth with uh, attaching some sort of bars and wires and we use them to close the jaw and fix the jaw in, in, in position until healing of the bone. Closed reduction. It is about establishing a proper occlusal relationship by wiring the teeth together, wiring the upper jaw and the lower jaw together. It is termed a maxillomandibular fixation, MMF, or the intermaxillary fixation. And I'm putting both terms because sometimes when you look at, uh, in Google for the IMF, you might have these guys popping out. You might have this one popping out. If you think of entertainment or you think of money, it's according to the, what the artificial intelligence is going to read up your mind, you are going to have this. Or you might have our IMF, this one. You might have this one. In the upper middle figure, this is the Erich arch bar. It is the typical and the gold standard arch bar. You are going to find it in the upper left view and the lower left view. In the upper left view, in some instances, when we install this arch bar and we utilize the hooks to fix the upper jaw to the lower jaw, uh, when we have malocclusion which cannot be reduced and controlled in the uh, time of the operation, we put elastics on the arch bars. We don't close with wires. We don't fix them with wires. So we do what we call the gradual elastic traction. The gradual elastic traction is going in a couple of days, it's going to pull the mandible against the muscle pull or, or the displacing muscle pull, and it's going to restore occlusion once more. When you got your restore you, 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 and you restore your occlusion, then you are going to resort to the stainless steel wires and close in the IMF, like the uh, lower left figure. On the lower right figure, we have how to install this arch bar. The arch bar is installed through in, uh, circumdental wiring. One wire is coming over the arch bar and the other one is coming under the arch bar and it's twisted around the tooth to fix the arch bar. Some authors prefer to use the posterior teeth only, the stronger teeth until the canine, and some use the whole dentition. I would recommend not to use the anterior teeth because sometimes they might sustain a trauma and they are a, bit, a little bit loose or mobile. You can use the arch bar for splinting them with, with, with composite or, or bonding, but if you, if you do, do a wire around it, it might lead to further displacement. And they are single-rooted, they might not withstand stresses as well. On the upper right figure, we have the smart lock hybrid arch bar. This type of arch bar, it is not uh, fixed to teeth with wires. In this figure, it is only fixed with screws to the cortical bone. So you use screws to fix it in the cortical bone, and it is adapted to the to the maxillary arch and the mandibular arch. And then you put who, uh, uh, your stainless steel wires around the hooks, and you can use IMF without fixing uh, the arch bar or the regular Erich arch bar around the teeth. We can also use what we call the IV or the eyelet wiring on the upper right. Uh, figure you can see how to do this uh, eyelet wiring you put it interdentally and you, you twist the wires from the lingual side or the parietal side and one coming from each end and one of the 
uh, tips of the wires, it goes inside the loop and then you twist both of them together. It gives you what we call the IV loop. Other authors prefer to use IMF screws. These IMF screws are screwed also into the cortical bone and they come with different designs and they have holes where you can pass your wire inside and then you can use them like the, the lower left figure and you can use them for IMF uh, during the open reduction or, 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 or as, a, as a, an IMF or closed reduction alone and it can give satisfactory results. In some instances, we use what we call splints. Like what you said before, when we have a bilateral uh, parasympathetic fracture, it tends to be lingually displaced. Some fractures are tend to be lingually displaced. So we put a splint like the lower left figure, it's a, a, a acrylic splint. Uh, sometimes we do what we call a split, uh, acrylic splint or a, a lingual splint only. How this splint is done? In the old days, we used to take impression, alginate impression, and then we pour our model and then the technician comes to sew the model at the fracture line and then put it in the right anatomical position. We do the reduction on the model. And then, uh, as you see on the upper right figure, uh, there's a, a sticky wax uh, sticking the, the, the both uh, model segments together after it has been uh, cut through the fracture line. Then you construct your splint and you can fix this splint either interdentally using the teeth or using circummandibular wiring. Nowadays we can fabricate these splints using the uh, virtual uh, planning and the software planning and 3D printing as well. So coming to the period of MMF, regardless of the method of fixation, the bone itself has a biology that we should respect. The bone needs to be remain relatively stable, no micro movement across the bony edges to give chance for the bone cells to heal. The range of the period ranges from three to six weeks. We have a, a range period from three to six weeks in the normal adults. On average, the bone gains 80% of its strength by three weeks. And it also reaches 90% by four weeks. So we need at least fixation for three weeks to give a good amount of bone strength to withstand afterwards function. This is the guiding timetable, and there is a great variation, as we said. We said that we can do it for three to six weeks, but sometimes we need to add to this period, and sometimes we need to subtract, subtract from it. When we have a tooth retained in the fracture line and we are anticipating infection, we should add one week of fixation. If you have fracture and the symphysis, we should add also one week of fixation. Patients aging 40 years and above, we should also add uh, one or two weeks of fixation. On the other hand, in children and young adolescents, we should subtract one week. And coming to open reduction. As we said before, open reduction is simply gaining surgical access to the fracture site, as we see in, in, in both figures. And we're going to use uh, what, whatever we use to, to, to fix the fracture bony segments together, either plate or screws, mini plates and screws, a dynamic compression plates, leg screws, or uh, only transosseous wiring. We are going to discuss indications, types of fixation in osteosynthesis, or what we call open reduction internal fixation, ORIF. We are going to give uh, a hint about Champe's lines of osteosynthesis, and Last but not the least, we are going to discuss the surgical approaches. Indications for open reduction. Displaced unfavorable fractures. Of course, unfavorable fractures might not be easy to, to get uh, controlled by uh, only IMF, especially if there is no teeth in the fracture line to hold it with, with occlusion. Multiple fractures of facial bone, we have, when we have concomitant fractures and unfavorable fractures, it is, it is usually advisable to use open reduction. Mid-face fractures and displaced bilateral condylar fracture. Fractures of an edentulous mandible with severe displacement of the fracture segment or maybe atrophic mandible and we cannot fabricate splints. Edentulous maxilla opposing a mandibular fracture. 
when we cannot use the, 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 the IMF, of course. Delay of treatment and interposition of soft tissue between the non-contacting displaced fracture segments. If we have delayed union or an intervening uh, foreign body material like soft tissue or any foreign material, we need to explore the, the fracture segment and clean and refresh the bony segments, and then we can, we can uh, let the fracture segments heal. Malunion, of course, it, it needs to be uh, used an osteotome to refracture it and refresh the bony segments and then go for a new healing period. There are some conditions that contraindicated the intermaxillary fixation. We have several conditions which contraindicate the intermaxillary fixation. In some cases, some people have got some cases of hysterical vomiting or, or repeated vomiting. Maybe this happens after a brain concussion or a, when you have the PC post-concussion signs and symptoms after the trauma. This case is contraindicated for intermaxillary fixation. Uh, handicapped patients, epileptic patients, and pregnant females are uh, uh, usually contraindicated from intermaxillary fixation. This is an interesting case of atrophic mandible. When we have, we can see uh, the mandible is, is severely atrophied, and we have a fracture here. It's been treated by a, a thick reconstruction plate. And you can see the fixation of the plate, drilling of the holes and fixation of the plate and the final on the lower left figure and the post-operative panoramic and lateral oblique radiographs. This has been done and the plate has been bent and adapted to the mandible intraoperatively. On the other hand, we can use the virtual software planning and printing uh, of a model like that when we have the CT and we have another case the mandible is, is fractured and a little bit fragmented look on the on the right hand side we have on the middle figure we have uh, the mandible fractured and the software is prepared and on the right hand side we have done what we call the mirror imaging we have done mirror imaging from the normal side or the on the right side of the patient to the left side and we have created a normal mandible then then we printed a, a, a 3D model on a, on a 3D printer and we have our reconstruction plate adapted to this model and then we go to the operating room we, we, instead of wasting time or adapting the plate we just use the, the, the plate itself as a template for reducing the mandible and on, we can see on the right hand side uh, it, it's a CT showing uh, submental vertex showing uh, the, the plate fixed in place. What about the complicated biomechanics of the mandible? Do you know exactly how many muscles are attached to the mandible? Of course, we know by heart the four major masticatory muscles and the other four uh, lowering uh, of the mandible muscles, the diagastric, the mylohyoid, the genials. We have about 13 muscles attached to the mandible. So, each muscle is acting in different direction and different magnitude and different situation. The continuous situation and the loading on the mandible had led to what we call tension and compression zones. We have near the superior border a tension zone. So when we have a fracture line, the, the both segments are tending to get away from each other. On the other hand, on the lower border, we, had what we, we have what we call the compression zone. So it is tending to get the, the, the segments closer to each other. To sum this up, the continuous muscle contraction, it acts on the mandible like what we call a hunting bow. If you know the hunting bow, it acts like the mandible, like a hunting bow, and we have, as we said, zones of compression and zones of tension. The zones of tension are on the superior border, and the zones of compression are at the inferior border, and the neutral zone is in the middle, almost near the neurovascular canal or the inferior alpha, where the alpha, inferior alveolar canal lies. What are the types of hardware we use for, for fixation of the mandible after we do the reduction? What we use for fixation? Sometimes we use non-rigid internal fixation. It's also called a functional stable fixation, like the mini plate and screw fixation and intra osseous wiring. On the, on the lower, uh, on the right figure, we can see the, the plates and the screw fixation. 
and this is the transosseous wiring, just a linear transosseous on the left or a figure of eight on the right uh, hand side. Those, of course, are uh, called uh, non rigid fixation. And I would recommend if we use such methods, especially in unfavorable fractures, we would add uh, 10 days or a couple of weeks of IMF after the operation to control or to give a chance for a good healing of the bone. What about the rigid fixation? We have the lag screw principle or the lag screw technique. We have a special drill. When you look at the middle figure and it drills through the bony segments, it is typically used with uh, 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 diagonal fractures or oblique fractures. So we have, as we see on the uh, left figure, the thread hole and the gliding hole. And when we apply the screw and start to twist the screw and screw it inside, it tends to pull or, or, or tends to uh, let the both segments come uh, close to each other. It, so this is what we call a rigid fixation or a, a, some sort of compression. It tends to compress both segments against each other. So that's why we consider this a rigid fixation. Uh, lag screw is typically used in, in, in uh, oblique uh, angle fractures or maybe in symphysial fractures as well, oblique ones. So it is a, some sort of rigid fixation which we can resort to and, and we, it, it, it will not need a uh, period of IMF afterwards. Dynamic compression plate, or DCP, it relies on the principle that the plate has a, a little bit spherical form, not a, a cylinder or a circular cross-section, and a little bit slanting on the edges. So the holes of the screws are prepared at the far ends of the plate holes, as we see on the, the green dots in the upper left figure. And when you tighten the screw, it is going to bring both segments together near each other because it's going to move inside the plate and it's going to compress both segments against each other. Like we see in this cross section, as the screw on the left hand figure, is tightened, it goes inwards and, and pushes the bony segment towards the other one. So this is why we call it a dynamic compression plate. Another plate has been invented which is called the eccentric dynamic co compression plate or an EDCP. It has been used to give both actions. The one, the, the, the both the middle screws on the, let's look on the left hand figure, both middle screws will give the compression and uh, both screws at both ends are oriented diagonally because when you are, you are screwing the screws there, they are going to follow the upward arrows and they're going to close the, the superior border and they go, you will not need what we call the tension band or uh, as we, we referred before that we have a tension zone in the superior border and this will lead to have a gap uh, or, or the two segments are gapping together. So when you screw this, the peripheral screws, it is going to close the upward gap or the superior border gap. And accordingly, we have two types of bone healing. On the right hand side, we have the primary bone healing. When we use a rigid fixation method like the lag screw or the dynamic compression plate or the EDCP, we are going to have literally or, or theoretically no space between both segments and this will give a chance for the osteoblast to bridge between both segments and it's going to what we have what we call primary bone healing and faster healing and this in more, most instances can withstand uh, masticatory stresses a movement of the jaw so we don't need to uh, have the patient put in IMF on the left hand figure we have the classic or the, the, the gap uh, between segments and what we call hematoma uh, occurs first and then after that craniation tissue organization and then starting of cartilaginous tissue formation then this cartilaginous tissue is mixed with uh, a new uh, invading fiber, uh, fiber woven bone and uh, remnants of craniation tissue and this is all this uh, swollen area we call it the callus it starts with the soft callus in, in, in the figure B and then it's getting a little bit with, with woven bone and 
further mineralization into a hard callus and finally in figure D into a mature callus and this where we have complete healing of the fracture. So the secondary type of bone healing it occurs when we put transosseous wires or the mini plates and screws non-rigid mini plates and screws or when we resort to the maxillomandibular fixation we have this type of bone healing and in all instances we have to respect as I said before the bone biology the bone had needs some time to be fixed in and needs some time to be kept for healing without any interruption without any micro movement please always remember this respect bone biology Another clinical tip which is very important, when we have an underbent plate in the figure A which is loosely applied, so when you come to tighten this plate you are going to have a little gap on the lingual cortex. But in order to avoid this you have to over bend the plate a little bit. You should, do a, you, you should not put it fully adapted to the bone, you, you should do an, a little bit over bending uh, uh, the plate and you, you, should, you should let it a little bit loosely applied. So when you are come to tighten the screws, it's going to close the gap and the lingual cortex. It's a very important clinical trick. So, we said before we are going to give uh, an idea about Champagne's lines of osteosynthesis. What are these lines? They are also called the ideal lines of osteosynthesis. The, as you see in the figure on the lower left side, it comes in the body region, runs the vertical height of about the tooth apices, around the tooth apices, from the canine region to the oblique line at the angle and the oblique ridge, and it turns in, on, on the medial aspect of the external oblique ridge and on the lateral aspect of the ramus as well. And we can watch two distinct lines in the symphysial area, we are going to refer to them afterwards. In this area, the bone thickness and the lateral cortex varies between 6 and 8 mm approximately. So, if you are going to put your plate in this uh, line, ideal line of osteosynthesis, so you can use monocortical screws only, don't resort to bicortical screws. If you place your, your, your plate on the inferior border, yes, use monocortical screws, 10, 12, what, what, whatever you would like. But when you are going upwards near the root uh, uh, the roots of the teeth or the teeth roots and the APCs, please use uh, monocortical screws which are shorter than 6 mm to avoid perforation and tooth injury. And of course you can be meticulous and, uh, about the inferior alveolar canal as well and thanks to the CT now you can calculate it by accurate by millimeter and you, you, you should know from the inferior border how far the canal lies and how far the longest root which is the canine mostly how far this root lies and you can put your plate exactly away or, or just uh, a couple of millimeters near your root and you can do this safely and thanks to the calculations from the CT. So as Champais uh, suggested or, or recommended that you can put through the body uh, of the mandible only a single uh, plate through the ideal line of osteosynthesis but however this cannot be applied to the symphysial area. The symphysial area are having rotational forces and we have here um, additional forces than the body of the mandible so it's too many plates as we can see there are two lines one at the inferior border and one which is a little bit uh, upper to it and or, or, or above it but it is also below the apices of the teeth and if it is by, 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 by any means come near to the APCs using a monocortical screw will not be, let you harm the roots of the teeth but I would myself recommend that you can measure the, the, the exact uh, teeth uh, root length and you can put your, your, uh, your, your plate a little bit lower or a little bit away from the root APCs to be safe. In the posterior angle region, there is a transition to the angle and the ramus, and we have here two projecting lines. One is going on uh, along with the external oblique ridge medially, and the other one is going on the lateral aspect of the ramus. So, uh, in some instances, you might need uh, only uh, one plate, like the one in, in the upper right figure, but on the uh, lower figure, you might see uh, you might need two plates, one on the inferior border and one in the upper border.
as we said before, one on the compression zone and one in to prevent the tension. But in some cases, when you have an impacted wisdom tooth, so we have a, a reduced amount of bone, or in some cases, some pa patients have the, the mandible height itself is a little bit reduced. So uh, in these instances, you might prefer to have uh, both plates. And I would recommend that in, in, in uh, unfavorable fractures or severely displaced fractures or in cases of coming with mono occlusion, you should resort to two plates maybe uh, to be on the safe side. So, as we said, you can place your plate on the uh, uh, external oblique ridge, like the position A in the lower uh, figure. But if you decide to place it on the lateral aspect, like in position B, you might need to use a stronger, thicker mini plate. Because in this area, the, the plate is going to subject into torsion rather than tension. It's going to have uh, subjected to high stresses, to a thicker plate or a one with a center uh, span which is broader or, 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 or larger than the, the, the regular mini plate, you might uh, think of using it or use a mini plate made of grade 4 titanium. So in, to sum this up, you need a, a stronger, thicker plate to withstand the torsion stresses in this area. And if you decide to use the lateral aspect or the, the plate on the lateral uh, border of the ramus, in this case you are going to use the trocar and cannula to, to, to be able to drill the holes and, and tighten the screws from the external aspect because intraorally is, is only applicable to the, the one on the top of the superior border and medial to the external oblique ridge but when you use the lateral aspect plate you are going to use this uh, cannula and trocar and to, to use them to, to do make the, the, the holes uh, in the plates and use the, the screwdriver to screw up your screws. So, it has been a dilemma and a controversial discussion all over the years whether to put a single mini plate or two mini plates in an angle fracture. So we always have a single versus two mini plates dilemma. A study was published in 2013, mandibular angle fractures, comparison of one mini plate versus two mini plates. They did a prospective study of 87 patients, 73 males and 14 females with favorable mandibular angle fracture. And it has been concluded that No significant difference was observed between the groups regarding the overall complication rates. And it seemed that the use of too many plates in this setting may not be warranted or any even cost efficient. So if you have a favorable mandibular fracture, you might resort to only a single uh, mini plate. On the other hand, there has been a comparison of single versus two non-compression mini plates in the management of unfavorable angle fractures, a prospective randomized clinical study it was published in June 2018. It has been concluded that in the management of unfavorable mandibular angle fracture, two mini plates must be preferred over use of single plate. So minim to, this would minimize the complications that might happen afterwards. And I see that it lies in the in the experience of the or the expertise of the operator himself and uh, sometimes his hunch. If you are able to detect this case can be treated even with with just simple IMF, you can go for it. You have a good experience in that, and you have done hundreds of cases like that, and you can go for that. And if you feel that you need two plates or you need an op reduction, they go for op reduction. So. It lies in, I, 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 I would recommend that this is the judgment of the surgeon and the operator himself, but let this be as a guideline for us. When you have a favorable fracture, undisplaced fracture, without complications, without infection, you can use a single uh, mini plate, but if you have an unfavorable, fra an unfavorable fracture, you can resort to two mini plates, as we said, one on the lower border and one on the upper border or on the lateral aspect on, of the ramus. And then we come to the surgical approaches. 
I found it a, a very interesting topic. We look on the left figure, you will find the surgical intraoral access to the uh, symphysial area. We call this uh, the vestibular or the curvilinear incision. It is done on two aspects. One, it's done like the undotted line in the, in, in the vestibule, about 10 to 15 millimeter away from the mucogingival junction, below the mucogingival junction. Then you incise, after you incise the mucosa and submucosa, you expose the mentalis muscle, and then you come to incise the mentalis muscle in a perpendicular fashion to the uh, labial or the buccal alveolar plate. Like this. After you do the curvilinear one, look at the right hand uh, figure. You do a step, or it's like a step uh, incision, a vertical incision into the mentalis muscle. In this case, when you are going to suture this back, you have to lift the mentalis muscle first and then do the suturing around it and fix the mentalis muscle to the upper uh, part of it and then you are going to close the submucosa and mucosa in the regular fashion. And afterwards you put a, a chin bandage for 48 to 72 hours to help maintaining the mentalis muscle in place and to avoid uh, hematoma or some sort of things that might lead to detachment of the mentalis muscle. I would prefer this incision or on, on, on the left hand side. Uh, you only leave about five millimeters off down the mucogingival junction. This rim of unattached mucosa or alveolar mucosa will make it easier for you to uh, do the suture backwards afterwards, and you are going to spread to, 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 to strip the whole mentalis muscle with your incision and do the digraphic. Uh, exposure like that and expose the inferior border and do your job put your uh, screw put your plates and screws and fix the fracture and then you can go and suture it back and of course in most in, in any in any case and or under any situation you are going to put your chin bandage to help to reattach the mentalis muscle in place and looking to the right hand figure the undotted line here, it, it, it denotes the uh, access to the symphysial region, and the dotted line, it is the continuation of this uh, line, but posterior to the uh, canines and at the mental foramen area. And at the mental foramen area, you cannot go 10 or 15 millimeter below the mucogingival junction. You can injure the mental nerve. You only go 5 millimeter below the mucogingival junction. In the body area, you only go 5 millimeter below the mucogingival junction. So, as to leave a good amount of alveolar mucosa, unattached alveolar mucosa to suture, use it for suturing back and to have a good access without endangering the mental nerve. You of course have to expose it and have to dissect around it and then you put your plates uh, in a regular fashion. The vestibular incisions and the intraoral incisions in the angle area have two variations. Variation A on the upper uh, left uh, figure and variation B in the upper middle figure. So, if you don't have a wisdom tooth, or uh, you, you, there is no third molar which is going to be addressed in the surgery, you use uh, this uh, type of incision A, but if you have a wisdom tooth that you are going to remove during the surgery, you use uh, the crevicular or the circular incision in the figure B, and then you proceed backwards towards the ramus. Some authors prefer to approach the uh, angle area via the submandibular incision or the residence incision, the retromandibular incision, uh, extraorally, but I would prefer myself to do it uh, intraoral unless we, if you have uh, a laceration, uh, skin laceration extraorally, you might use to, to, to dissect and access the angle fracture and then close it afterwards. So. Uh, it, is li it also lies in the preference or the hand of the operator himself. But remember, when you are dissecting backwards and upwards, we have a sensory buccal nerve. The sensory buccal nerve, it comes across the anterior border of the mandible from the medial to the lateral aspect in the region of the coronoid notch. And so to protect this nerve, when you go backwards until the retromolar area and you need to dissect upwards, please do this bluntly, not uh, sharp with a sharp lancet in order to avoid to cut and following numbness in the buccal uh, mucosal region to protect your uh, long buccal nerve, please. And regarding the vaccinator muscle, as we, uh, we, draw, we draw the attention to the uh, mentalis muscle 
in the symphysia region. Also, the vaccinator muscle will be incised during uh, our surgical axis here, and we need to give uh, or take a full bite. We need to take a full bite of, of suture to uh, let the strip muscle be uh, put back again with, 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 with uh, and reattach the muscle to, uh, during wound closure. So you have to not get a superficial mucosal only bite with the needle. You have to take a full thickness uh, bite with the needle uh, in the vestibular incision to be able to uh, place the vaccinator muscle attached in place. And here is a simple presentation from the AO Foundation uh, website. Uh, you can uh, find how to put a, a plate uh, in the angle area. Uh, this is a single plate on, and it has been adapted to, to uh, part of it. It lies on the lateral border, the anterior one, and uh, the posterior one lies uh, ventral to the external oblique ridge. And you place it with a, a holder, a plate holder or a pucoperiosteal elevator, and then you do the drilling in the upper right figure in the hole just posterior to the fracture line and then you tighten the screw and but it's not so tight you only insert your screw and you don't let it a little bit tight this gives you a chance to move the the plate anteriorly uh, or laterally or upwards to be able to put your your uh, your holes and adapt the plate exactly then you do the the screw on the lower right figure the screw of the uh, the second screw which is the one anterior to the fracture line and you also insert the screw in the upper left view upper left image insert the screw but not let it a, a little bit tight then you do the the anterior one the anterior the second one anterior to the fracture and finally you are going to go to drill the fourth screw the one the most posterior one and in this instant it might not be easy to put it to place this drill when you are having the mouth closed and we should remember we have here IMF we put IMF it's not meant that we are doing open reduction that you are not going to use IMF let's remember once more the whole mark and the success mark is the occlusion so when we go for a, a, an open reduction we also insert our arch bars or an IMF screws or uh, IV loops or whatever and when we start the operation and when we do our surgical axis we put the teeth in, in occlusion together and we maintain this occlusion until we uh, fix our hardware and put the screws and fix them but in this instance and in this uh, unique position sometimes you cannot put the, uh, the final screw when the mandible uh, is close to the maxilla so in, in, uh, uh, look at the lower uh, left image you are going to release your IMF and open it and come uh, from the direction of the maxillary teeth lateral to the maxillary teeth and put your drilling and then put your screwdriver and fix the last uh, screw of the plate and then you are going to put your uh, you check your occlusion and put the patients in IMF once more but remember one more thing that you should release your IMF or put elastics only during the recovery period because sometimes the patient might get uh, nausea or vomiting uh, if, this, if there is vomiting when you are closing the patient in IMF this might lead to uh, suffocation and aspiration of the vomitus so uh, in cases of general anesthesia during the recovery the IMF is released but of course during installation of the hardware and fixing the plates and fixing the fracture and reducing the fracture we should also be keeping the occlusion so the occlusion is kept whether you are going to do uh, closed reduction IMF you are going to put the teeth in occlusion and they are going to close it in occlusion and when you are inserting uh, a hardware or a, or, a, or a plate and screw on the inferior border on the superior border on the lateral aspect of the ramus uh, you are putting two plates in the symphysial region whatever you are going to do you should always keep the teeth in occlusion while you are inserting your hardware please remember the occlusion your success clue a success mark lies in the occlusion and finally, we have this uh, post-operative uh, view of the plate secured in place. And the, you, you, you can note that there is no step on the inferior border of the mandible. Coming to physiotherapy and rehabilitation phase after a mandibular trauma,
our goal to uh, reach 40 millimeter of maximal interincisal opening four weeks post-operatively. So we need that the patient uh, regains his, his full mouth opening. Sometimes it is done uh, due uh, active exercises, opening and excursive exercises and warm fomentation on the masticatory muscles to relax them. But if the, for any reason the patient did not reach this goal, you can use uh, the, the upper uh, right figure, uh, what we call a therabyte. It's a device which can help the patient to uh, open his mouth passively without using his muscles. It's, it, it, it does stretch to the masticatory muscles and the elevator muscles passively. Or you can use tongue blades, uh, put a little bit, uh, uh, you can use the therabyte uh, device or the tongue blades, put several tongue blades and let the patient train himself to open his mouth widely. What about the oral hygiene? When we use extra oral approaches, there are going to be no problem to interfere with your oral hygiene routine, daily routine. But in, on, in cases of intraoral wounds, there are going to be edema and pain, and we, we are afraid that uh, using the brush or the floss might endanger the, 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 the wounds or lead to uh, suture uh, loosening or, or wound dehiscence. So uh, sometimes you are putting arch bars, you have wires, you have elastics, so we are directing the patient to remove the elastics. We should teach him how to remove and fix the elastics once more. We you should direct the patient to remove the elastics and get his uh, good oral hygiene measures because it's very important. Using a soft toothbrush, dip it to, in warm water uh, to make it a little bit softer. It, it can clean the teeth and the arch bars. Uh, as I said before, the elastics could be removed. Chloroxidine mouthwash and oral rinses should be uh, used uh, and prescribed daily. But if the patient has a larger debris, he can use one-to-one -one mixture of hydrogen peroxide and chloroxidine. So the bubbling action of the, of the peroxide and the oxygen can help remove the, 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 the upper debris. Water pick, of course, is very useful and helpful, but please watch it. If you have an intraoral wound, don't get the water pick or the water stream near the incisions, please, but you might have a wound dehiscence. The diet depends upon the stability of the internal fixation and it can vary between liquid and semi-liquid and uh, sometimes the tolerated by the patient. But if you are resorting to the IMF or the maxillomandibular fixation, the patient is going to only uh, on, on, on liquid diet and he might have some, uh, some uh, nutritional supplements such as uh, multivitamins or, 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 or uh, highly protein uh, preparations. This might help in, 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 in rapid healing, but uh, you are going to stick only to liquid diet. And finally, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much.